As I said, we're on the second missionary journey of Paul, and just by way of reminding you, there were three journeys. Journey number one, journey number two, journey number three. Journey number two started at the end of chapter 15 and began in chapter 16 with the Macedonian call as they went across the Aegean Sea to the continent of Europe. They went into Philippi. The Lord opened Lydia's heart. She believed. Slave girl was converted. The Philippian jailer. And then Paul and Silas driven out of Philippi. They come beginning in chapter 17 to the city of Thessalonica. Now I'm going to outline this chapter for you if you're taking notes. In verses 1 to 9, we have the city of Thessalonica. And I'll kind of talk about that and where it is. We'll look at the map. But in the response to the word, we see that they are resisting the word. There were those who believed, but primarily there was opposition and resistance to the word of God. Wherever God's word is preached, you'll find these different responses. So begin following with me in verse 1 of Acts 17. Luke says that when they, and the fact that he says they in verse 1 indicates Luke is no longer with them in their group, that Luke stayed back in Philippi, no doubt, to pastor them and disciple them. So they, being Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they passed through Apollos and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica. There was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as his manner was, went unto them and for three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ, or Messiah, must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Messiah. And some of them believed. Here's the response. Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few." But the Jews which believed not, they were moved with envy, and they took them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. King James were bad dudes. They were just bad guys. And they took these lewd fellows of the baser sort, and they gathered a company, and they set all the city in an uproar, and they assaulted the house of Jason. They sought to bring them out to the people. That is, they were looking for Paul and Silas, who were staying at Jason's house, and they were going to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, verse 6, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down have come here also. When Jason hath, and whom Jason hath received, and all they do is contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And so they trouble the people and the rulers that troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things and when they had taken security of Jason or Baal of Jason and they let the others go. Now go back with me to verse 1 for just a moment. As I pointed out, Luke most likely stayed in Philippi and they come to the city of Thessalonica. Let's throw the map up again on the screen if you can. And basically, we have here the second missionary journey. Started in Antioch, went to Derby, Lystra, Iconium. This area here, modern-day Turkey, known as Asia. And they traveled over here to Troas, got the Macedonian call, sailed across the Aegean Sea right here. They land in Nepolis. They go into Philippi. So right now, we've just left Philippi. We're going down to Thessalonica. And then you can see very close to Thessalonica is Berea. Then Paul takes a ship and he comes down in southern Greece to Athens. And that's where we're going to be tonight. So we can take the map away from the screen. But when you're going to the book of Acts, it really helps you to study geography. I was thinking about it today. When I was in school, by the way, I was a horrible, horrible student. So there's hope for your kids, ladies and gentlemen. I was a horrible student. I thought, man, if I could go back to school again, I, I would just love geography and history and those things that I was just bored stiff over and, 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 and to be able to pay attention to these things. So basically, we see here that they come to Thessalonica. That was the chief city of that area. Again, it was a Roman colony, large metropolitan area, and there was a synagogue there, which meant there were 
at least 10 male Jews, probably many Jews there. Unlike Philippi, now there's a colony of Jews there. So Paul goes to the synagogue, and I want you to notice it says, and as his manner was. So I want you to notice the methods here of Paul the Apostle. In Romans chapter 1, remember Paul said, I am not ashamed of what? The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the power, the, the dunamis, the dynamic, the power of God unto salvation. And then he said it like this, to the Jew first, and then also to the Greek or the Gentile. And that's really what Paul was doing. He was going to the Jew first. I think the church today is uh, making a mistake and not seeking to evangelize Jews. We kind of just left them alone and we thought they have their religion, why bother them? But reality, we should be praying for them and reaching out to them in all peoples and all lands and everywhere. The Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? And who doesn't matter who they are, what their religion is, we need to reach them with the truth of Jesus Christ and especially the Jew, the Jew first and then also to the Greek. But I do believe also that the church is lacking in power today because it is no longer preaching the gospel. It's preaching philosophy and psychology and a social gospel and all kinds of other things, self-help kind of pep talks, feel-good messages, but it has abandoned the gospel and that's where the power of God is. And Billy Graham's last message to America that he gave sitting in the chair in his house, he said that the cross is the power of the gospel, bringing back to people to the cross and preaching the cross. And uh, we need preaching today that focuses on Jesus Christ and the good news. It's not good views, it's good news. It's a historic record of Jesus' incarnation and crucifixion, and resurrection and ascension and exaltation, and he's the savior of the world. But notice Paul starts with Jewish evangelism as his manner was in verse 2. Now I want you to notice these four things that Paul does. He reasons with them. Now it says he did it for three Sabbath days. So this would be three weeks. And when, by the way, when you study Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, there's a lot there in that epistle about the coming again of Jesus Christ, that the Lord is returning. It's full of what theologians call eschatology, the study of last or future things. And it's interesting that Paul was only there for three weeks, and yet he felt these new believers needed to know about the coming again of the Lord and the revelation of the Antichrist and the things about the end times. That's another mistake the church is making today, too. We've abandoned the study of prophecy and the hope of the coming again of Jesus Christ, which is all through the Scriptures. So for three Sabbath days, he did these three things. Number one, he reasoned with them, or four things. Number one, he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Notice, out of the Scriptures. Would to God that preachers today would preach and give a reasonable defense of the gospel out of the scriptures. All preachers should be Bible preachers. There's really no other kind of preaching. It should be the opening of the Bible, the reading of the Bible, the exposition of the Bible, and the application of the Bible. And I believe the pew should demand that, by the way. I believe that if more people in churches... Supported churches, went to churches, or the churches they go to, if the pastor isn't preaching the Word, that he, they would say, we want you to preach the Word. We want the Bible. That's what we want. And should the day ever come, God forbid, that I'm not preaching the Bible, you need to kick me out of here. Or just kick me one or the other. <laughs> Do something to get me back in the Bible. And we need to preach the Word. So he reasoned out of, I love that, out of the Scriptures. Remember in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, God says, come now, let's reason together, says the Lord. Christianity is a reasonable religion, and you can reason with people out of the Scriptures. And when it says out of the Scriptures, that was the Old Testament. They didn't have the book of Acts. It was being written. They didn't have the New Testament epistles. They were just being written. So 
Paul using the Old Testament Scriptures went into the synagogue and began to reason with the Jews. And if you want to reach Jews for Jesus, you need to use the Old Testament to show them that Jesus is their promised Messiah. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus used this method in his post-resurrection appearance to the two on the road to Emmaus. It says that he opened the Scriptures and showed them that it was necessary that the Messiah must suffer and die and be risen again from the dead. And later on they said, did not our hearts burn within us as He opened to us the Scriptures and talked to us in the way? So we need to open the Old Testament and show them Jesus, the promised Messiah. Now, not only did He reason with them out of the Scriptures, but notice secondly, verse 2, that He opened the Scriptures unto them. He opened. That means He explained them. And then thirdly, alleging, verse 3, that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. That it was necessary, Messiah had to suffer and then rise from the dead. That alleging indicates to prove. The word literally in the Greek means to lay alongside. So it means to use evidence to prove something. He would lay it alongside to prove something. So he reasoned, he explained, and he proved that Christ was the Messiah and he had to die, be buried, and rise again from the dead. And then he says that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Messiah. Whenever you see that word Christ there, it's a reference to the idea of that he's the Messiah. The Old Testament would be Messiah, and the New Testament would be Christ, means the anointed one. But notice that he preached. The word is keruso. It means to herald. It means to proclaim. And so it's the proclaiming. It's the proclamation. It's not the discussion or the debate. It's the heralding of not, as I said, good views, but the good news about Jesus Christ. Now here's the response. We saw it when we read the text. Some believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of those that believed, there were devout Greeks and a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So it describes those Gentiles as well. And some of them, God fears, no doubt, they were in the synagogue that responded and that believed. But there were those who responded in unbelief. Verse 5, the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took with them these lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and assaulted the house of Jason. So and whenever the Word of God is preached faithfully and clearly and powerfully, there's those who believe and then there's those who do not believe. There's always a line drawn. Those who receive Christ, those who reject Christ. Those who trust in Christ and those who reject Christ. And to procrastinate, as we're going to see at the end of chapter 17, to say, well, I'll think about it, is actually a statement of rejecting Christ. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. And so the Gospels preach, there's always that dividing line. Notice if you didn't, by the way, in verse 6, these guys are referred to those that have turned the world upside down have come to our city. Isn't that great? Would to God that the world was saying that about the church today, right? In reality, as we've often said, they weren't turning the world upside down. They were turning the world right side up. The world was upside down, and the world is upside down. And what Christians do is we turn the world right side up by sharing the gospel. But we see here that they were resisting the word. They assaulted the house of Jason, looking for Paul and Silas. They couldn't find him, so they made Jason post bail and then he was able to go home. But they scour them, or they kind of scoot Paul and Silas away, as we'll see in the next verse, by night. Notice now we move in verse 15, or verse 10, excuse me, to verse 15, to the second city and their response, and that is to Berea. So I just showed it to you on the map just a moment ago. Berea is just a little bit southwest of Thessalonica. Now, I've never been to... Philippi. I've never been to Thessalonica, and I've never been to Berea, but I have been to Athens. And every time I read about Paul going to the Athenians, 
it, it so excites me because I've been there a couple times and it's such a cool place to visit Athens. But now he goes about 40 miles southwest to Berea and we see that they are receiving the word. So in Thessalonica, they resisted the word and people will resist God's word. But in Berea, we see here that they're receiving the word and searching the word. Follow with me verse 10. It says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night. Now, Paul, in his preaching, there was always either a riot or a revival or sometimes both. It was a riot to travel with Paul, literally. Everywhere you went, he was causing a riot. He was getting thrown in jail. Someone said the first thing he probably did was check out the jails because that's he, he knew he was going to spend the night there when he got to town, you know. So there was the rejection, and then there was the belief. And so they kind of hurried Paul and Silas out of town. And I thought it interesting that there's no mention of Timothy here. So you, it almost makes you wonder where Timothy is. Maybe stayed a few extra days there in Thessalonica to continue mentoring and discipling the believers. But we don't know. But they come to Berea, verse 10 who coming thither went into the synagogue again of the Jews, to the Jew first. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, and of the honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached, again heralded, of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and they stirred up the people. And immediately the brethren sent away Paul. So here it is again. He starts another riot. They stir up the crowd and they send away Paul. So they sent away Paul to go as it were by sea, but Silas and Timothy abode there still. So they stay there in Berea. And so it says that they conducted Paul, brought him to Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So they took him down to a port, they put Paul on a boat, and they ship him off, and they stick around for a while. You know, you're causing a riot, we need you to go. So he's sent off, and he goes down to Athens, and they stay there. And by the way, you have now a reference to Timothy in verse 15. But the classic passage, you need to mark it in your Bible, in verse 11, that we all love so much. It says, those in Thessalonica, this, it says, those in Berea, excuse me, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they did three things. Number one, they received the word. Number two, they received it with readiness of mind. And number three, they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That's why we use the phrase, be a Berean. Be a Berean. When you ever hear that term, be a Berean, it means be a person that is eager to search the Scriptures, eager to study the Bible, eager to dig into God's Word. So they were receptive to the Word, they were ready in their minds. When it says they were more noble, by the way, it carries the idea of that they were more open and receptive and thoughtful. It's not talking about mobility in the sense of that they were royalty. It's speaking of the fact that they were more responsive and more receptive and more open, that they were really sponges and listening to what Paul said. So they received it with all readiness of mind. But... They searched the Scriptures daily to see whether what Paul was preaching was so. Now, of course, there's many ways to apply this, but I want to encourage you, be a Berean. What does that mean? It means don't believe everything somebody tells you, right? Open your Bible and study it for yourself. Now, you don't want to be critical. You don't want to be fault-finding. You don't want to be judgmental. You want to be receptive. But you want to think with your mind. You want to ask yourself, is what the preacher's saying biblical? Is what the preacher's saying scriptural? Is what the preacher's saying really what the Bible's saying? 
whether it's John Miller, whether it's Greg Laurie, whether it's Franklin Graham, uh, it doesn't matter what who the preacher is on the television, on the radio, in the church, whoever it is, you bring your Bible. You open the Word of God. And you ask yourself, is this what the text really says? Is this what it really means? Is that how it's to be applied? And you read back before the text. You read after the text. This is why it can be dangerous when a preacher just takes one verse, pulls it out of context, and imposes his ideas or his own meaning on the text. When we take the meaning out of a text, it's called exegesis. When we put a meaning into the text, it means eisegesis. We're putting in our ideas into the text. So when you listen, listen carefully. And when you listen, listen thoughtfully. When you listen, listen critically. And I can't, I can't stress that enough. Too many Christians are gullible and silly. I see churches full of people listening to so-called sermons that are anything but biblical, and they're cheering, and they're screaming, and they're yelling, and they're excited, and they're all pumped out, and what the preacher's saying is not really even biblical. But it makes them feel good. It makes them happy. And what he's saying is really exciting, and he's telling stories, and, and, and it's just really a great motivational speech, but it's not biblical. But you need to ask yourself, is what he's saying scriptural? Is what he's saying biblical? Is what he's saying true? Because not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of God. The Bible has to be rightly divided, has to be rightly interpreted, and rightly applied to our lives. So open your Bible, study your Bible, become a Berean, familiarize yourself, look up the cross-references, study the context, Make sure that what the preacher is saying is true. And they did that, and Paul wasn't above that. And he said, wait, 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 I, I did, I'm Paul the Apostle. You don't need to study this. You don't need to look at this. You don't need to examine these things. They're true. I, I, he, he, he welcomed their readiness and their searching the Scriptures to see whether these things were true. And so therefore, many of them believed, verse 12, and of honorable women were Greeks, and of men not a few, but Satan always comes with his messengers to try to hinder the preaching of the word. And so the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached by Paul and Berea. What do they do? Verse 13, they come thither and they stirred up the people. Satan always opposes the preaching of the gospel. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Satan, if you preach the gospel, Satan will oppose you. If anyone preaches the gospel, they'll experience opposition and attack. So they ship off Paul, verse 15, to Athens. And this transitions us to verse 16, to the end of the chapter, verse 34. Now, Athens was the capital of Achaia, which is southern Greece. I won't go to the map again, but northern Greece is what's called Macedonia, and southern Greece is what's called Achaia. And Athens is down toward the bottom of Greece, which is known as Achaia, but it's the capital there. It's the center of Greek culture and Greek philosophy. It was the home of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. It was a city that was uh, had a population of at least 200,000 at this time. And it was, it was really the center of intellectualism and Greek thought and Greek culture and the Greeks glorified man and the intellect and their philosophy. So now he comes to Athens, verse 16 to verse 34, and now we have the ridiculing of the word. So there's the searching of the word, the receiving of the word, there's the rejecting of the word, and now the Athenians ridicule or mock the word, though there's always those few that do respond in faith and believing. But let's look at it beginning in verse 16. It says, now while Paul waited for them, that is Silas and Timotheus or Timothy in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city completely given over to idolatry. 
Therefore, he disputed in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the markets daily with them that met with him. And there were certain philosophers. What else do you want to find in Athens but philosophers? And the group of the philosophers, there were the Epicureans and the Stoics. And he encountered them, and some said, what will this babbler say? What's this storyteller say? The word babbler literally means seed picker in the Greek, and it means a storyteller. Others, some seem he, that he seems to be setting forth some strange gods. Why? Because he preached again this Caruso, this proclamation unto them, Jesus and the resurrection. Paul always preached Christ. Now, there some say that when Paul was in Athens that he watered down the message and tried to make it too palatable for the Athenians. But I, I believe clearly that Paul, again, even though he connected with their Greek culture, he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And so they took him and they brought him to what's called the Areopagus. It's also known as Mars Hill. And I had the privilege twice, I've had the privilege of standing on Mars Hill and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we met up on Mars Hill. It's this little outcropping. And it's just kind of west of the Acropolis where the uh, uh, temple was. But he was taken to this Mars Hill. Now Mars Hill, the Acropolis in verse 19, is a court on religious morals. It's, it's kind of a, a, a courtroom kind of a setting. And we don't know if Paul was actually being tried or he was just given a, a, a platform to kind of express his views or his ideas, but he's talking to these Epicureans and Stoics, and I'll come back to them in just a moment. He says, now, we want to know what you're, what you're speaking. For verse 20, he says, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, and we would know whereof thou sayest these things or what they mean. For all the Athenians, verse 21, strangers which were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Now, doesn't that describe the intellectuals of our day? They, in their universities, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. And they get together, and all they want to do is talk about something new and something novel, something trite. And so Paul comes to the famous city of Athens, beautiful place, and he encounters these two philosophies, Epicureanism and Stoicism, verse 18. Now, Epicureans believed and practiced that pleasure was the chief good and goal of life. The Epicurean philosophy is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's the playboy philosophy. This was the Hugh Hefners before Hugh Hefner came on the scene. Just have a good time. Do whatever feels good. Their view of the divine was that God was transcendent and that God, which is true, but that God outside of our kind of time, space, material world didn't interact with man, didn't come down to man, uh, didn't really you know, connect with man. And uh, they had this idea that God was far off and God was removed so we can kind of live however we want. And it doesn't matter what you do with your body because God doesn't care about the body. He doesn't care about the physical. He doesn't care about the material. He just kind of can do whatever you want. And that philosophy is with us today. And then there are the Stoics. Now the Stoics, their, their view of God was pantheistic. And that means that they believed that God was in everything. Instead of being outside and kind of uh, beyond our world, transcendent, they believed that God was the trees, and that God was the water, and God was the air, and God is you, and God is me. These are people that we have with us today in this world. I remember years ago, my first time I ever went to the city of Santa Cruz. I'd never experienced hippieism like I'd ever seen before in my life, you know. I remember talking to a guy at Santa Cruz and he's saying that trees were just as valuable as human beings. And that trees were divine, just as the flowers are divine. 
and animals were divine and we're all God and you are one and we are we, you are me and I am you and we are one and we are all together, you know. I think he was listening to the Beatles or something. And, and, and today people have the same idea. Shirley MacLaine's discovery, I am God. And people go to a seminar and pay $190 to find out they're divine. I'm thinking, what kind of a dumb God are you that you have to pay to find out that you're God? Or her saying, I looked in the mirror and I realized I was looking at God. You know, I mean, it just, it's just insane. So Paul encounters these two philosophies. Stoicism, by the way, was they were fatalists. They, they, they believed that they were self-sufficient, but they, they tried to seal themselves of love and emotions and, and they didn't want to feel anything, so they just went through life very stoic. It means to, to, not, to not allow yourself to come under the power influence of, of your emotions or of feelings. And so they bring him to the Mars Hill, and we have, as I said, these things. Paul saw, in verse 16, he saw a city full of idolatry. I want you to notice these four things about Paul. He saw a city full of idolatry. Paul wasn't in Athens as a sightseer. He was there as a soul winner. And it's fine to look at the Acropolis and look at the art, look at the statues, and I've been there. All the idols. Someone said, a traveler at this time, said it was easier to find an idol than it was to find a person in Athens. It was a city full of idolatry. So he saw that with his eyes. And then notice what Paul felt. He was stirred in his heart. He was stirred in him. He had the emotions, the, the feeling of this is horrible, this is sad, this is tragic. Now, uh, sometimes people will get caught up in the aesthetics and the art, artistry of idolatry and of the... Uh, of the uh, the edifices that they built or the temples that they built. And they are marvels how they build those ancient temples. But what Paul saw was through the culture, he saw through the aesthetics and the artistry, and he saw sinners that needed Christ. And we need to have that same heart. He, he looked through the, the tinsel and the exterior, and his heart was stirred. He, he was burdened, we might say, for their souls. And then thirdly, he disputed. So it means that he spoke. So he saw, he felt, and he opened his mouth, and he began to speak. And who did he speak with? Well, he spoke, spoke with religious people, the Jews and devout persons. He spoke with working, day, working class people, the blue-collar workers. He met them in the market daily, and he met with them on the streets. And then he spoke to the sophisticated intellectuals in verse 18, certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoic. So the gospel's for everyone. It's for religious people. It's for the every average day Joe. And it's for the sophisticated intellectuals. And he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Again, Paul the preacher. And so they took him, verse 19, because he was the preacher, and they brought him to Mars Hill. Now, beginning in verse 22, it's the fourth thing that I see about Paul, and that is Paul's sermon, what he said. So, what he saw, what he felt, what he did, and now what he says. Verse 22, and it's marvelous. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. So, earlier it's called the Areopagus. Now it's called Mars Hill. This is this courtroom. And he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Now, this is an unfortunate translation in the King James Bible. It's not too superstitious. What Paul said, I perceive that you are very religious. I, I perceive that you're very religious, a good perception. You're standing in Athens, you're on Mars Hill, and you see all of these temples and all of these idols, and what is he saying? He said, I, 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 I gather you people are quite religious. <laughs> And they would have said, yes, yes, thank you very much, we are. And he connected with them. He's not in the synagogue speaking to Jews, 
So he has to connect with these Gentiles where they are at. He said, for I passed by, verse 23, this is Paul's sermon, and I beheld your devotions, and I found there an altar with this inscription, it was to the unknown God. Think about that. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now, Paul starts to get a little more poignant here. He says, I I perceive you're very religious. I was cruising through your town, and I saw one of your altars, and it said, to the unknown God. Think about that. They had so many gods, and they're false gods. They had so many idols that they thought there might be a God up there that we might miss, so we don't want to offend him. He might send a volcano or earthquake. So let's have the altar to the unknown God. So if any gods out there that we didn't build an altar to, we don't want them to get bummed out at us, okay? We want to have all our bases covered. But Paul saw that, and he used that as a point to connect. And we should take note of that in evangelization and witnessing to people in that we connect with them where they're at. We maybe throw out a question or make a comment or start up a conversation. I think our witness is going to be a lot more effective if when you approach somebody, you first connect with them. You don't just walk right up to somebody and say, you're going to hell, get saved. Oh, by the way, my name is John. You, you for, hey, how are you doing? Where are you from? What do you do for a living? You know, and, uh, and you connect with them and you talk to them. You get to know what's happening. And then you begin to share the gospel with them. And, and, you, and you kind of, you don't compromise the message, but you contour it to kind of connect with them and who they are and where they're at. But you never compromise or water down the message. So he says, this unknown God, I, I'm going to declare him to you. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to catch this. He talks about God in four different areas, four aspects of God. First, he says he's creator. So God's greatness is addressed in verse 24. He says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he dwells not in temples made with hands. Now, this must have blown them away. Wait a minute, you're trying to tell me that that God isn't worshipped with our hands, that these idols are no good, that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. And that's exactly what Paul was saying. And again, we could tarry on this for some time, but the point is that God created all things. God is transcendent, but he also is connected because the heavens and the earth are the work of God's hands. God created the material universe. So he starts with these Gentile pagans by talking about God as creator. One of the things that makes evangelism today difficult is that people are brought up on the theory of evolution. They're brought up not on the theory of evolution, but they're brought up on what is told the fact of evolution. Evolution is not a fact, it's a theory, and it's a theory with a lot of holes and a lot of problems. And you don't have to be that intellectual to realize that something cannot come from nothing. And there's something. And it comes from something. And there had to be a great cause for this amazing effect, right? So we just come up with this idea that there was an explosion. There was a big bang. Scientists do believe today that the creation, the cosmos, had a beginning. Which is what the Bible says, by the way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For years, they thought that the earth was just eternal, that it always existed, and it just, you know, it just evolved. But now they realize that there was a beginning, and they call it the Big Bang. And they don't know what caused the bang or what banged on the Big Bang, but there was a Big Bang. And next thing you know, there was a little, you know, horny toad or a polywog, and they had a freckle, and the sun hit the freckle, and an eye came out. And then two eyes popped out, and then two arms popped out, and Rolex watch appeared on his wrist, and... You have mankind, you know. I know I'm being a little silly here, but it's not scientific. It's not logical that just all of a sudden there was nothing and all of a sudden there was something. Well, they mock that idea where they say, well, you Christians just believe that God has always been. Where did God come from? Here's the answer. God didn't come from anywhere. Because he is God, he is eternal, okay? And there, there was no, nobody created God. He wouldn't be God if he was created. He's eternal and self-existence. 
And you either believe in eternal matter of some shape or form, or you believe in an eternal God of some shape and form. And I think it takes a lot more faith to believe that there's eternal matter without a divine mind behind the creation of the cosmos than to believe that there's an eternal, transcendent, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God that created this world. So Paul starts with creation. And many times today, when we're going to reach people around us, we need to be able to give them an answer why we believe God created the heavens and the earth and that evolution is not true. And then he moved to God as provider, creator, and then provider. Notice verse 25. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needs anything, seeing that he gives to all life and breath and all things. God doesn't need anything. This is another amazing verse. God doesn't need us. Does that surprise you? Sometimes preachers will say, God needs your money. Really? Whoa. He's in trouble because I'm broke. Can you imagine God needing our money? God doesn't even need our worship. God doesn't need you to go to church. You need to go to church to worship God. God doesn't need anything. He gives to all life and breath and all things. So we go from He is creator, God's greatness, to He is provider, God's goodness. And then thirdly, He is ruler, God's government. He hath made one blood all nations of men. Now the Greeks thought that they were a superior race. They thought all other races were inferior. And they actually sought to perfect man and deify man. Paul says, No, he's made one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. And he hath determined the times appointed and the bands, bounds of their habitation. So he's the God of history and he's the God of geography. And it says in verse 27 that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him. And they can find him, though he be not far from any one of us. He's also the God who is near. God of history, God of geography, and the God who is near. The Epicureans believed he was outside of anything man could connect with. And think of Christianity. Christianity doesn't teach that we are God, or the trees are God, or the earth is God. It doesn't teach that God is just transcendent, but it means that the Word became flesh. We teach that God became a man and dwelt among us. And that God came down to His creation and reached out to us in the redemption of Jesus Christ. He was the God-man. And then it says, for in Him, that is God, we live, we move, we have our being. As certain also of your poets have said, for we also are His offspring. I again don't want to get sidetracked, but I've heard Oprah Winfrey say that her favorite verse in the Bible is verse 28. By the way, when Oprah Winfrey quotes her favorite verse in the Bible, you can bet that she quotes it out of context. And she hasn't properly interpreted it or understood it. She thinks that I am God, you're God, we're God, and God's everything, and God's in me, and God's in you. She, she, she's, she's basically a, an Epicurean. Or she's a Stoic. She, she, she's, she's, she's bought this philosophy. And she's actually quoting... The Greek poets is what she's quoting in the context. Now, Paul does agree that we are of his offspring, but only in the sense that we're made in the image of God. We're created in God's image and God's likeness. But when it says, in him we live, we move, we have our being, it means that God sustains us and God helps us. And string, it doesn't mean we are God. It means God is our helper and strength and our sustainer. And he does give to all life and breath and health and all things. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, and that we're made in God's image, we ought not to think of the Godhead as like unto gold or silver or stone or graven of art of man's devices. And then, lastly and fourthly, He is Savior. It speaks of God's grace. And the times of His ignorance, Paul still preaching, verse 30, that God winked at, but now God's commanding all men, all people everywhere to do what? To repent. Notice, God's commanding us to repent. If God commands us to repent, 
And if we don't repent, then we're breaking God's commandments. It's disobedience. Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. Now again, I realize that I, I probably should have taken this in two, two, week, uh, two weeks. And some of you are going, yes, yes, you should have. For you. Some of you are saying, that's the only thing I agree with tonight. <laughs> but I'm trying to give you a big picture. I'm trying to give you the survey. I go too slow on Wednesday nights, we'll never get through the book of Acts. My last act study will be my retirement from church. So here he is, and he's preaching. He's saying he's not only the creator, but he is the savior. God isn't only transcendent, but God has come down in the form of a man, in the likeness of a man, or not likeness of man, in, in essence, a man, a sinless man, in the person of Jesus Christ. But notice that he speaks of repenting because of the day of judgment, verse 31. Do you know that God actually has a day set for judgment? God actually has a day of judgment. There is a day of judgment coming. But you know what people do? They mock that idea. They mock the idea. Well, they did that too when God sent a flood. Noah was building an ark. You ever heard the story of Noah and the ark? It's not just a cute little story for decorating your kid's nursery. Which, by the way, I think that's kind of strange. We decorate little children's nurseries. It's about the judgment of God. Put Noah's Ark in your little kid's room. Sleep, sleep well tonight, little Johnny. <laughs> God destroyed the whole earth by a flood, but good night. See you in the morning. You know. But you know what? It actually happened. I know that sounds kind of elementary, but I want you to think about it. It actually happened. God actually destroyed all living things on the earth. He saved the animals and he saved Noah and his family, but he destroyed the whole world. And people mocked. They say, oh, Jesus isn't coming again. Well, they mocked Noah too. And they said, it's not going to rain. It's not going to flood, but it did. And God destroyed the earth. But you say, well, God sent a rainbow. He promised he wouldn't do it again. He promised he wouldn't flood the world, but he didn't say he wouldn't burn the world. So, it's going to destroy by fire. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. And God's going to come in judgment. But there's coming a day when Jesus Christ will sit upon the great white throne, as it declares in the book of Revelation. And God has proven that Jesus will be the judge of all mankind in that He raised Him from the dead. You know, we talk about Easter and the resurrection and the glorious hope of eternal life. But do you know the resurrection of Jesus Christ also guarantees the judgment of the wicked? and the unbeliever, and the non-Christian. You reject Jesus, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You either bow your knee now and it means salvation, or you bow your knee then and it means your condemnation. So proof of God's judgment, the resurrection, verse 31 from the dead. Now notice in closing the three responses. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, verse 32, some mocked, others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, certain cleave unto him and believed, among whom was Danusius and Areopagite and a woman named Demirius and others with them. So there's three responses. There's those who mocked, verse 32. There's those who procrastinated, we will hear the again of this matter. And then verse 34, there are those who believed. So my question in closing tonight is, what category are you in? Are you going to mock and say, I don't believe it? I don't believe that God came down in the person of Jesus Christ and that He died for my sins and rose from the dead? And you mock that idea? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says God will not be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You can't mock God and the things of God and not expect to face the certain judgment of God. You say, well, I, I, I don't really want to mock it, but I'm not ready. I, I just want to postpone my decision. I'm undecided. 
To be undecided is to be decided. To say, I'm not ready to believe in Jesus or trust in Jesus, then you're rejecting Jesus. Because he actually says that he's at your heart door knocking, and if you hear his voice and open the door, he'll come in. The Bible says now is the acceptance time. Today is the day of salvation. It says if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. And tonight, if you're not a Christian, maybe you, I don't know how a non-Christian can come in on a Wednesday night, but that happens. And if you've come in tonight, or you've been coming tonight, or coming on Sunday and came tonight, and maybe you're just listening to the sermon, but you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, that's what, it, that's what you have to do to become a Christian. He commands everyone to repent. It means that you turn from your sin and that you trust Jesus as your Savior. You don't go to heaven by being good. You go, by, go to heaven by trusting Jesus. Don't put it off. Because that's the third response is that they believed. It means they put their faith in Christ. They trusted Him. They believed in Him. Have you trusted Jesus tonight? Have you taken His hand and put your faith in Him? By grace, we've been saved. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Let's pray. If God has spoken to you through this message today and you're not sure that you're a child of God, maybe you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven. You've never really trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I would like to lead you in a prayer right now, inviting Christ to come into your heart and to be your Savior. So as I Pray this prayer. I want you to repeat it out loud, right where you are, after me. Make it from your heart, inviting Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I pray that you'll forgive me and come into my heart and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe in you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God heard that prayer, and I believe that God will and does forgive your sins. We'd like to help you get started growing in your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. If you just prayed with Pastor John to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you. And we'd like to send you a Bible and some resources to get you started in your relationship with the Lord. Simply click on the contact link at the top of the page and tell us something like, I prayed to accept Christ. We'll get your Bible and resources mailed out to you right away. God bless you and welcome to the family of God.